what better place to smarten up on snacks than right here at Wise in Berwick, Pennsylvania. Their 600,000 square foot facility delivers nearly every size, shape, and style of salty snack that you can imagine. And they have big plans to create even more. With the salty snack industry ballooning into a $28 billion business, we've turned snacking into a science, or maybe an art form. Today, we're going to dive into some of the salty snacks that Americans love the most, like potato chips and tortilla chips, jerky, cheesy snacks, popcorn, and pretzels. Then we'll also go behind the scenes at the first pretzel company in America, where we'll see the secrets of pretzel making. The barley malt was kind of a secret ingredient for him at the time. It gave it the flavor that nobody else had. And we'll not only learn all there is to know about the invention of potato chips, but also the surprising origin story of the Flaming Hot Cheeto. Plus, with every flavor imaginable, how do potato chip companies still innovate new flavors each year? Watch as I get exclusive access to try unreleased cheese doodles. Oh boy. Well, it's time for you to take a break, treat yourself, because this is Modern Marvel's Snack Food. And hopefully, we'll have a few free samples. Oh my gosh, it smells amazing in here. And as a wise lover, seeing all these chips, I just want a giant bowl of dip. I'm going to get a first-hand look at the process of how Wise takes potatoes and turns them into the golden goodness we know as potato chips. Wise has 300 different snack products. Combine these with others like Frito-Lay, Uts, Nabisco, Pringles, the list goes on. You can imagine how serious Americans are about snacking. Wise is a big player in the local community as well. Some employees have worked here for three, four, even five decades. Today, I'm going to meet one of those loyal, longtime employees, operation manager, Terry Boyer, who has been here for 45 years. And Terry's dad worked here for a half century. Terry is gonna show me the secrets of how they make, pack, and ship millions of salty snacks every single month. Potato chips alone, you guys are selling 23 million bags per year, is that right? Per month, per month. Between our potato chips and our corn-based snacks, we sell almost a half a billion bags a year. In 1921, Earl Wise brought home some extra potatoes from his family's delicatessen and started making potato chips by hand in a copper kettle. A year later, he bought his own truck to deliver the potato chips, and within four years of that first batch of chips, Earl Wise built his first factory on the grounds where the current plant is located. And today, the company Earl Wise founded 100 years ago now ships its snacks to all 50 states and 13 different countries all across the globe. To celebrate our 100th anniversary, we're coming out with some different flavors. I have two here on the table for you if you would like to try them. These are them. brand new. Yep. I believe that I'm probably the first outsider to try them. Terry is challenging me to identify these flavors, and am I up for this challenge? Mm. I got a bit of heat, a bit of tanginess. It's reminiscent of the classic barbecue chip, but there's a little bit more to it. Oh, man. I've never had anything like it. It's sweet and heat. That is awesome. These mad flavor scientists are geniuses. OK. Mm. This one's a little more difficult. Delicious. I, I give up. You stumped me. What is it? This is hickory barbecue. Peach habanero is for, more for the millennial consumer. This is our traditional consumer. You can't get any more traditional than a barbecue flavored potato chip, but we added some zesty spices to it. Will you show me how we make these? Can we yep, go let's the continue through the factory and we'll start at the beginning and show you how the process and how the product is made. Up to you.
Here, Adam, is where step one of the process is. This glorious process of making potato chips starts with getting the potatoes into the building. We'll get between 12 and 15 trailer loads of potatoes a day, 50,000 pounds per trailer. We'll literally be digging potatoes in the morning and frying them and putting them in the bags at night. That's how fresh they are. So right here in this truck, that's 50,000 pounds of potatoes. That's correct. What does that translate to in terms of potato chips? In finished product, 80% of that weight of those potatoes is water. So we're only getting 20% solids. So that 50,000 pounds won't weight to about 12,000 pounds of finished chips. OK, so what do we do first? I'll let you unload this trailer. That's so cool. So you can hit the two buttons here. All right, here we go. That's so cool. If I wasn't seeing this, I'm not sure I'd believe what's happened. When I pushed those buttons, I had no idea that the entire truck was getting hoisted up into the sky to shake the potatoes out of the back. There's a whole truck. I'm just shaking it out. This is so cool. This little tiny button is taking an entire trailer and just tipping it like a box of cereal. And so all these will get fried by the end of the day. By the end of the day, these will all be fried. That's nuts. The potato is everywhere. These starchy spuds are actually the fourth largest crop in the world behind rice, wheat, and corn. In the 16th century, Spanish conquistadors brought potatoes to Europe from Peru. But for 200 years, nobody would eat them. People actually thought they were poisonous or only worthy to feed livestock. That is, until a French pharmacist named Antoine Parmentier saw the potato as something that could feed a nation. And just like we would today, he turned to the ultimate influencer of public opinion. He got King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette to wear potato flowers on their clothes as a way of enticing people to see potatoes in a new way. And starting with that royal endorsement, potatoes soon became one of the top food sources for Europe, then America, and then the rest of the world. There are a few different accounts of how the potato went from feeding European nations to becoming the almighty potato chip. But for one of the most common stories, we have to fast forward to Saratoga Springs, New York in the year 1853. During a crazy dinner rush at a restaurant called Moon's Lake House, a picky customer sent his french fries back to the kitchen, saying the potatoes were cut too thick. The chef, a part African-American, part Native American man named George Crumb, was less than pleased, and his reaction made history. George Crumb decided to shave them as thin as he could get, fry them, and sort of turn them into potato chips. The legend continues that much to Chef Crumb's dismay, the potato prank backfired. The customers loved the crispy snacks, and he wasn't the only one. These new Saratoga chips became an instant hit in Saratoga Springs and spread throughout the country. Between the 1920s and 1930s, thanks to innovations like the automatic potato peeler and continuous fryer, companies like Wise, Lay's, and Utz were born. Now, America consumes 1.5 billion pounds of potato chips every year. So where do the potatoes travel? The potatoes you've unloaded outside are then transferred by conveyors. They're traveling on an overhead belt right above us and then diverted right into this bin here. So this is full of those potatoes? Of those potatoes. Each one of these bins that are in here will hold a whole truck, which is the 50,000 pounds of potatoes. This is where they'll get a wash before they go into the peeling area. So this water is doing two jobs in one. Not only is it cleaning the potatoes, it's transporting them to the next stop in the process. So we have trucks to this conveyor system, hopper to, the, to being washed, pipes to peeling. Peeling. All right, let's go let's peel. Go. After you. In this area here is where we'll do the peeling of the potatoes before the frying. OK. After they're cleaned, the potatoes ride up the belt and get dumped into these big hoppers. The potatoes come in the tube, into a hopper here. Uh huh. From that hopper, they're fed into a peeling mechanism. And this is what's inside those peeling drums, where we actually this peel the that. potatoes. This apparatus is inside both of those small drums. 
Does it get like full all the way to the brim? No, it won't be full all the way to the top. About 80 pounds of potatoes will be in the drum for each of the matches. What does that translate to in terms of bags? It would give you 40 bags of finished potato chips. Feels like sandpaper inside. That's exactly what it is. It's 24 grit sandpaper. Inside there, this bottom piece spins. Oh, this so spins. As these potatoes go around, uh huh. You can see what's happening. Oh, and because they've gone through the flume, it's wet. It's and wet. It's easier to it peel. It helps remove the skin. So as the potatoes rotate around inside the drum. They rub against the abrasive bottom and sides, and the peels get sanded away. It's just the slightest bit of pressure because it's already moist. I was actually wondering if it would be too weird if I could try it and then like see if I could see the flavor in the final chip. Is that cool? Sure. All right. Last year, Salty snacks like chips, jerky, pretzels, and popcorn reported more than $19 billion in sales in the U.S. alone. Here at the Wise Factory, we're following the process as potatoes become potato chips. And I'm curious how a slice of one of these spuds tastes in its raw form compared to the eventual chip. They're really delicious. It tastes like a green bean, but like uh, starchy, a little sweet. This slice is like an apple. It actually has a lot of body to it. So when you make this into a chip, it's going to have a lot of flavor because more starch, more sugar, and it's going to preserve that earthiness. Really, really good. Potato chips are an undeniable classic, but there's another salty predecessor that's been in the pantheon of snacks for more than 1,400 years. The legend says that pretzels were born in northern Italy in the year 610 AD, and today they are a more than $1.3 billion global industry. The average American eats two pounds of pretzels each year, but in Pennsylvania, they eat six times as many pretzels as the rest of us. So we're going to Julius Sturgis in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, the oldest commercial pretzel makers in the US. Family owned and operated, this historical company established early recipes and pretzel making methods that they still employ today. Julius, as a 15-year-old, began an apprenticeship at a local bakery just down the street. Most bakers, they would leave bits and pieces of dough in the cooling ovens overnight. Julius had the idea to twist these pieces of leftover dough into a pretzel shape and sell them on the side. He saved his money for 11 years and opened up his own bakery. We are stepping back into history, over 150 years old. We are America's first commercial hard pretzel bakery. The original ovens built by Julius remain on site. Their soft pretzels are made fresh daily and twisted by hand using the original recipe from 1861. I'll use water, yeast, and I have a little bit of barley malt in there. The barley malt is kind of a secret ingredient. It gave it the flavor that nobody else had. Right now, I'm working with a stand-up mixer Julius Sturgis didn't use that when he made pretzels here. He used a barrel, a wooden paddle, and worked it by hand, and a lot more dough than what is in here at that time. OK, check it out. According to the legend, pretzels were created more than 1,400 years ago when an Italian monk used a piece of twisted bread to reward his students for learning their prayers. It's said that the crossed pattern represents the folded arms of the praying children. And the three holes represent the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. At the historic shop where Julius Sturgis operated, they continue his legacy, baking pretzels just the way he did. But at the Julius Sturgis plant, about 30 miles away, they make between one to five million hard pretzels every single day. Back at Wise, we're jumping back into the process of potato chip production. We've seen them delivered, washed and peeled. Now Terry's going to show us how they get to look like potato chips. Just up a few steps is where the potatoes get sliced into that classic potato chip shape. You guys got to see this. Potatoes here, chips here. That's how fast that process happens. 
Terry's removed the blades from the huge slicers to show me how they work. Whoa, hey, wait one second. Can you see how thin that is? Precision 60 thousandths of an inch is what these are sliced. And they'll be within two to three thousandths when they're sliced. That thin. Oh my gosh, I, I never thought of potato chip making as this precise size. It's pretty incredible. How many blades are in each? There are eight blades in each of the heads, and those blades are changed every two hours of production. Because they get dull? They will get dull. You want the best thing for quality chips is to have the sharpest blade you can to get that precision cut. This actually is 300 pound batches that what? we will do. Turning 300 pounds of these into 300 pounds of these takes how long? 30 to 40 seconds with two of these heads. The 300 pounds will be sliced into the 60 thousandths inch slices. Wait, can I try Can I try one? Uh-huh. That way, right? Yep, towards me. Yep, ready? And now I'm barely using any force. If I just do this time and time again, I'm going to keep getting the most exact slice. So to make our ridge style chip, no way. The cutter is actually different. This blade right here, yeah. slide that just like we did the other one. <laughs> Come on. After they've come out of the slicer, the potato slices travel along a belt to this area where they'll be fried. Are these are the fryers? These are the fryers. You can see a batch going right into the fryer now. Oh, I see. Can we go check that out? Yes, if you want to, walk down. Gino Caprolletti's there. He'll be glad to show you how this process works. All right, thank you. Let's go meet Gino. One of the world's favorite snacks comes in tasty little triangles, Doritos. And wouldn't you know it, these chips that make so many people happy come from the happiest place on Earth. 1955, Disneyland had just opened in Anaheim, California. And a few years later, the Frito-Lay Company opened their restaurant, Casa de Fritos, on the grounds. One day, a delivery person from their tortilleria noticed the kitchen staff at Casa de Fritos discarding all their stale tortillas. He suggested they cut them up, fry them, and season them. And you can probably guess what happened next. People loved it. They enjoyed these doraditos, which is what they called them, and that translates to uh, little golden things in Spanish. The marketing execs at Frito-Lay also started hearing about what was happening in their restaurant, and the name will eventually shrink down to Doritos, and they're huge success. When Doritos launched in 1966, they were almost like plain tortilla chips. Two years later, they gave them a taco flavor. The original flavor of nacho cheese didn't debut until 1974. Back at Wise, I'm heading to an essential part of the chip making process. Oh, oh, baby. The frying. But I didn't realize it would look like a swimming pool. Look at this. I can't tell you how great it smells in here. These gigantic fryers magically turn potato slices into potato chips. And fry manager Gino is going to show me how they do it. So tell me a little bit about the fryers. These are batch fryers. We run around 500 pounds an hour on each one of these. As someone who's actually fried my own potato chips at home, I can tell you this. The way they do it here at Wise is truly amazing. A huge batch of potato slices swims in this hot tub of cholesterol-free sunflower seed oil for about nine minutes. And when they come out, they magically transform from potato slices into crispy potato chips. By constantly churning them up, they don't stick, they don't sink, and you get those beautiful folds that make them all crunchy. And remember, Terry said that a potato is largely water. So we're cooking a lot of that out. So there's a lot of steam, but not a lot of grease, which is really amazing. I'm resisting the urge to reach in very, very, very hard. Besides chips and cheese doodles, there's another salty snack we all love. It started as a sustaining food source hundreds of years ago. And today, it's nearly a $4 billion global industry. I'm talking about jerky. 
Jack Lakes is by far the largest jerky brand in the world with more than a billion dollars in annual sales. We're heading to New Glarus, Wisconsin, where Steve Joe, the Jack Lynx plant manager, is going to walk us through how they make their iconic meat sticks. They start the process by taking truckloads of raw meat and grinding it into a form that they can work with. Each year, this plant goes through about 17 million pounds of beef that's ground up and run through this 3,000 pound mixer in order to create a homogenous meat blend called an emulsion. They're combined with spices, water, salt, and other ingredients to create the emulsion that will eventually go over to the kitchen and be put in the casing. Then, that emulsion is pressed through a 1 8 of an inch hole plate to stuff it into a collagen casing. These meat sticks get loaded onto these racks they call trucks. They will load up to 180 of these trucks a day. That is a lot of meat sticks. Next step is to load them into their gigantic ovens to be smoked. Most of these ovens will hold 14 trucks. So they're large. You could park a couple cars in them if you wanted to. Then smoke anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours. You might like the modern chili lime or sriracha flavored jerky as a road trip snack, but jerky has a long history in America. Jerky comes from the conquistadors in, in Central America, and they witnessed the Inca drawing uh, llama meat. One of the forms of jerky came out of the Incan Empire. The word jerky comes from the word chadki. As European settlers adopted the method of smoking and drying meat, the word charki became jerky. And to many early Americans, jerky wasn't just a snack. These days, we really think of jerky as something that you might just have on a whim. But really, in early America, it was a matter of survival. Jerky has come a long way from sustaining early Americans through the winter to the modern day traveler through a road trip. Clearly, jerky is here to stay. Jack Link's meat sticks come out of the smoker cooked, and then they head over to be cut into 15-inch sticks, 20 at a time. Then they're vacuum sealed and boxed up by hand, and they're ready to be sent out into the world. Back at the Wise factory, Terry is showing me another side of their epic snack lineup. Whoa, where have you taken me? This is where we're making our famous onion rings. Man cannot snack on potato chips alone. Sometimes you need to shake it up with something crunchy, something savory, something oniony. In 1969, Wise started making their amazing onion rings, and they have become one of the most popular snacks that Wise produces. Instead of slices of onion that are dipped in batter and then deep fried like you get in a restaurant, these onion ring snacks start as an O-shaped pellet made out of corn seasoned with onion flavor. Here at Wise, they make the pellets and season them before they even get to the fryer. Where is the oil? Down that way? Inside that fryer. The smell of oniony goodness in here is incredible. These little onion ring pellets take a quick dip in this hot oil and magically transform, puffing up into the onion rings we know and love. Wow. That's amazing. Would you like to try the finished product? Hell yeah. Who am I kissing? I mean, light, crispy. It's more savory than just onion. That's the misconception. I bet a lot of people think just onion. You're welcome, America. I eat deliciousness for you. Americans eat almost 2 billion pounds of potato chips each year. That equals about 6 pounds of potato chips per person. And one of the most famous purveyors of potato chips is the legendary Wise Snacks, where Terry is taking us to the next step in the potato chip process. So what is this? Adam, this is our OptiSort machine. It's an optical picker that actually picks any of the defects chips out that has a brown spot or black spot. Wait, how does it separate all those chips? It has a high-speed camera inside here. 
the belt is running at 600 feet per minute, and the camera will take a picture of every individual chip as it passes underneath. So let me show you what that camera is seeing. That's the chips on the belt. And so I'm looking here, black, brown, green, and other. The black, brown, and green are the chips that we would pick out. And it's looking for the colors black, brown, or green. Correct. The way it works is the camera takes a picture of every single chip that shoots past on the belt. If it sees a black, brown, or green chip, it signals one of 128 air jets that will blow that individual chip out of the stream into a reject pile. The good ones will go over, the bad ones will get separated. So after sorting, where do we head? Then they go to packaging where they get salted and seasoning. Follow me, I'll take you there. You got it. Besides potato chips, there's another crunchy, salty snack that Americans eat tons of, literally popcorn. Americans eat 17 billion quarts of popcorn a year. That's enough to fill the Great Pyramid of Giza seven times. Can you even imagine going to a movie theater without smelling that wonderful smell of popcorn? One of the biggest draws of popcorn was how cheap it was. You know, just for a few cents, you could have enough of a meal to last you for an hour of viewing. Movie theaters realized that people were coming to the movies just to eat popcorn and, and watch the show. And as it turned out, popcorn is so cheap per pound that the movie theater owners could actually make more money off the popcorn that would sell to their patrons and off the tickets to their movies. So theaters really fully embraced popcorn with Gerard W. Dixon in 1938, when he actually installed popcorn poppers in the front of his movie theater. And so that meant that when patrons came in, they were sort of accosted by the smell of hot oil and butter that made them want to have to get popcorn before they went in to watch the movie. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. So there was a period when popcorn sales started to decrease, and this was in the 1970s and 1980s when viewership went from being sort of a communal going to the movie theaters affair to staying at home and watching on TV. By the 1980s, two inventions went mainstream into every house in America and kept popcorn as part of the movie watching experience. By the 1980s, America's love affair with mass marketed popular culture was at an all time high. We even had VCRs. Films you could see at the movie theater, you could then see six feet in front of you on a television. And of course, microwave popcorn. Makes all the sense in the world. In the 1940s, a Raytheon scientist was experimenting with a magnetron when he felt a candy bar in his pocket melt by the microwaves. He got the idea to expose popcorn to the microwaves, and boom, it immediately popped all over the lab, and the rest is history. Popping popcorn was even included in the original patent for the microwave oven. Since then, manufacturers continue to make new flavors and products to keep the popcorn industry popping. Back at Wise, Terry is showing me how they make popcorn as well as another finger-licking favorite snack. Just have like the biggest popcorn popper in the world. We actually have two popcorn poppers that will go through that popcorn. This is a cooling area before this product is actually packaged. So it's coming down to conveyors, being fed into the different conveyors that will weigh that product and package it. And that's our famous white cheddar popcorn. Now we're looking at two cheese flavored products. So I obviously recognize these. Those are the classic cheese, cheese noodles. noodles. I've discovered the cheese noodle river. <laughs> I've heard fables of this. Can I try these? Sure can. It's like we're panning for gold. You can imagine they can't just let anyone reach in and scoop these pure, perfect, still warm cheese noodles fresh out of the cheese noodle river. These were the most sought after snack at every birthday party growing up. It's better than I remember it. It actually reminds me of sharp cheddar cheese bread. Like it's a strong cheddar note 
and a little bit of yellow American. Try that. Oh, hell yeah. The popcorn is light, fluffy, top notch. Food develops cheese flavoring. We will introduce you to Mike, our flavor master, in a little bit. Wait, they're called the Flavor Master? He is our Flavor Master. That's the coolest damn title I've ever heard. In today's snacking industry, flavor is a big business, and there is a hot new flavor trend sweeping through all brands of snack foods all over the world. And it all began with a janitor at the Frito-Lay company. Richard Montañez was the son of Mexican immigrants, and in 1976, he was 18 years old, and he had just been hired at the Frito-Lay plant in Rancho Cucamonga, California. After years of working as a janitor at the Frito-Lay factory, Richard noticed that a flavoring machine on the Cheeto line had broken down, leaving a pile of unflavored Cheetos. The proverbial light bulb went off, and he decided to take some of the plain Cheetos home to experiment. Richard Montañez was inspired by the flavors that he grew up eating, uh, particularly of the Mexican street corn or the Mexican elote, with flavors of chili powder and cheese and, of course, lots of lime. When he got a flavor he was proud of, Richard mustered up the courage to call the CEO of the company and pitched his new spicy flavor of Cheeto. What happened next changed his life and the world of snacking forever. The head of Frito-Lay invited Richard Montanez to pitch his new flavor of Cheeto to the board. Of course, they were blown away and flaming hot Cheetos were born. By 1992, they were introduced to the snack world, and it has never been the same since. Today, the Flaming Hot concept is a big marketing driver for the Cheeto brand, with all sorts of Flaming Hot ideas. I mean, you got Flaming Hot everywhere, and they all do very, very well for the Frito-Lay company. As for Mr. Montanez, he was promoted from his position as a janitor and eventually became an executive vice president. His story is absolutely inspiring. People throw around the term American Dream quite a lot. Well, that is exactly it. Here at WISE, we're following the potato chips as they go through the process of being made. After they're fried and sorted through the high-tech optical sorter, they travel up here to the flavoring section. In 1954, the first flavored potato chip was born in Ireland. It was cheese and onion flavor. Today, there are hundreds of flavors, ranging from barbecue to maple bacon, from pickle flavor to prawn cocktail. Here's the gate uh, for the chips that have to go through here. And here's the skill that regulates the seasoning. This is zesty jalapeno. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a little spicy up here. I was hoping Jose would let me try one of these zesty jalapeno samples right out of the hopper. I hope you like it. Spicy. You smell the spice. <laughs> oh my god. The spicy, but not like too much. They are so crunchy. So crunchy. Spicy but a little bit more like tangy, like a real jalapeno. What's happening here? What does this machine do? OK. This is now we call the packing machine. OK. This will dump the product and fill the bag down at the bottom. At the bottom, we have another system that will start making the bags. Raw potatoes, wash them, peel them, slice them, fry them. Season them. Packaging next? Yes. Bolinos. We've gone from unloading the potatoes to flavoring the chips. The next step in the process is to see how Wise gets these chips out the door and into your hands. There's 14 buckets that you saw upstairs. Right. There were five the ones that were in the computer will pick the best combination. We'll hit the target weight of this bag within a tenth of a gram. 
So the actual roll of bags is where? It's on the back? From the back. It actually looks like a roll of paper towels. Oh, I see. So it's a continuous channel. Continuous channel. Now, is it is there a heating element to solder it close? Is yes, that how it works? there's a heating element in the back that runs vertical here to actually seal that and make the tube. Then there's heating elements in each of the jaws that will crimp that bag shut and cut the bag off. This whole process hinges on perfect orchestration and coordination. So it seems to be like that that dance between human ingenuity and the reliance on the state-of-the-art technology. That's correct. Here they come. And if you think I'm letting one more bag go in front of me and not try these things, you are sorely mistaken. Oh, they are still warm. Believe me, I understand how lucky I am to be tasting these chips here at Wise that were potatoes that I dumped out of a truck just a few hours ago. So amazing and so delicious. What? Well, don't judge me. It's so good and spicy. I love it. When we get back, the man, the myth, the legend, flavor master M M M Mike. Sir? Flavor Master Mike is gonna let me taste his latest inventions. One is a sneak peek of a new flavor about to be in stores. The others will never be tasted again. Oh boy. Wise has been kind enough to show us how they make their magical potato chips, cheese doodles, and other snacks. As a final treat, Flavor Master Mike is going to give me an exclusive tasting of a product that is going to hit the shelves later this year. OK, what do we have in the mystery bags of love? OK, these are our new cheese doodle. Three flavors. This is a progression. As, okay. we, as we whittle down the, the flavors as we went along, these three were the finalists. So this has still not yet hit the shelves, right? And this, yeah, this one never will because it didn't make the final cut. Really? Right. So this is like limited edition. This is This is right. like a hyper strike. This is like a streetwear drop that you can't get to. This is friends and family only. Bright red, I always associate with heat. Oh boy. That's a humdinger. Woo! Wow, there's like this black pepper in there because I, I feel a little bit of a sneeze coming on. So what was the reason these didn't make it? Uh, we thought there was a little bit too much smoke in that flavor. It's smoke? A, you were right about the pepper. It, it's the chili pepper lime. These are the, the two finalists. It's like the first runner up and the second runner up. Oh, these look awesome. They almost look like chicken fingers. Look at that. Again, a sour note, a little bit of a heat note, but also a faint sweet note. It's it's basically a heat. It's called a lava heat. And uh, you were right, it has less heat than the other one. And that's the reason it was rejected. It didn't have enough heat. And that's only a final. So this is the winner, or is and this? And this is the winner. And this is the one that we are going to be launching. Oh. We're back, oh. back to red again. Whoa. Fire engine red. Do not attempt to adjust your dial. This is a sneak preview, people. I hope you appreciate what you're getting. These are delicious. They're not as, they're hot, but they're not as aggressively hot as number one, and not as sour. What I like about these, it hasn't lost the cheese element of it. That the other flavors, I got the sour, I got that heat. Here, I got that heat, but it's still a cheese doodle. But do not approach lightly. I am salivating like a Rottweiler looking at a T-bone. I am, no joke, delicious, but don't rub your eyes. Secure the bag, people. Extreme cheddar. Boom, coming your way. Summer 2021. Flavor Master Mike, the great people here at Wise, bringing you literally the new hotness. Who doesn't love a good snack? And who could possibly resist all the deliciousness here at Wise? These good people literally work around the clock to make sure that your senses are satisfied and your palate is pleased. 
So the next time you're tearing into some marinated, mouth-watering jerky, or sinking your teeth into the pillowy softness of a fresh-baked pretzel, or crunching your way through the savory, spicy, cheesy, crackling perfection of your favorite crispy snack chips, remember, it takes a lot of hard work to make snacking so easy. So when your hunger has you hankering, and your taste buds are tingling, and you're in the mood for some comfort food, take a break, sit on back, Treat yourself to a snack. See you next time.